Hello, everybody. I am 13. Welcome back, Link. Uh, and tonight, not going to lie, a little bit drunk, and uh, I've been excited about this one. So we're going to be doing Sigarda's Aid with Massive Effing Hammer. So I did end up putting TV14 for language all across the board. I've tried really hard not to swear in the past, but kind of going to let tonight go because we are playing with a massive fucking hammer tonight. So somebody, when Modern Horizons got spoiled user add cheese until edible which i fully agree with but on reddit made this image of cigar to Zade with a massive hammer so that's what we're doing tonight again massive fucking hammer that's the entire game plan so what we're going to be doing is taking a mass fucking hammer and handing it to somebody i started brewing this deck like a year and a half ago trying to use ogre's cleaver and that's just plus five plus oh. So Colossus Hammer was just a godsend. So idea is we take the new Colossus Hammer. One mana, eight equip. Equip creature gets plus 10 plus 10 and loses flying. Then we're going to hopefully have a cigar as eight out. Put it into play, instant speed. Auto equip it to a creature. Creature's going to get plus 10 plus 10. First creature that came to mind was Core Duelist. It's a 1-1 one, one that has double strike while it's equipped. Core Duelist makes contact. It's 22 damage. So this is capable of a turn 2 kill. Turn 1 Core Duelist, turn 2 Cigar Zade. Equip up the hammer, one shot somebody. Then we do have a couple of different options for the combo. Typically for a combo to be viable, you need two of every single piece. So you have eight copies of it. Well, Core Outfitter, we're only running two copies, but it's going to work similar to Cigar Zade. If the equipment's already on the battlefield and we cast a Core Outfitter, then just auto-equip up the creature, swing in. Blighted Agent, Infect with Massive Fucking Hammer, is actually going to be a one-shot kill. Same with Ink Moth Nexus. Then, last but not least, we have plenty of protection. So we're going to try to treat this like Infect. We have a little bit of a different game plan than Infect, but Giver of Runes is going to make it so our creatures get protection so they can go in unblocked. It's also going to make it so that they dodge removal spells, same with Apostle's Blessing, and Teferi means that the opponent just can't interact on our turn. Super fair card. So fair. But, uh, yeah, so tonight we are hopefully just going to smack somebody with a massive fucking hammer. All right, what do we have here? We have protection, a blighted agent, no way to actually equip it up, a little bit of interaction. I think this has to be a mulligan. Lennon mulligan should actually really help this deck. And uh, this is a turn three kill. I, I like that. I'm fully on board with that. So probably core outfitters, the weakest card in this hand. We'll ship that card back and then... We have to get Ink Moth Nexus out now so that it won't be summoning sick. Actually, as long as it's turn three, let's get Giver of Runes out. That's probably the best sequencing. But Ink Moth Nexus comes down next turn. Cigar to Zaid. <laughs> it's burn. All right. Well, that does make it a little hard for us to protect our creatures, but we will make do. Uh, actually, do I just want to attack? If I attack, I hit for 10, and then just another attack off the Giver of Rooms, they won't be able to kill her. Yeah, we're actually just going to do this the uh, hard way. Oh, you think it's Wizards? That's probably fair. Either way, they shouldn't have an answer for 10-10. Uh, then we don't really have a backup plan. Should the hammer actually fall off of the Giver of Runes? But whatever, this is a turn to 11-12. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all right. Well, that was technically a turn to win. Uh, all right, so if this is Wizards, want some Dispels, probably want some Thalias. So... 100% bringing in the Orok Champions. It just gains life and also gives us pro-red to swing in through things. Uh, Leyline of Sanctity typically comes in versus burn because in that way they can't actually target us with their burn spells. But seeing as how they're going to invest in creatures, it's probably less important. Uh, how do I feel about Thalia? 
Dahlia will slow both of us down about the same, so she can just stay in the side. Sword of Fire and Ice probably loses value. We're not really going to try to grind this out. And Marion Crusader, none of the colors are relevant. So this was always just going to be an easy cut. I wasn't very happy with this card in the first place. And three mana just get bolted feels like a bad place to be at. Uh, the protection seems relevant. The paths seem relevant. Hmm, is it really just a dispel? Maybe the Apostle's Blessing. I have the feeling that the life for the shock is relevant. <laughs> oh, we already got the massive hammer. Okay, so we have Path. We have a Giver of Runes. We don't really have a win condition or a hammer, so I think I have to send this back. This is actually the colored mana sources, redundant creatures. Uh, so what does it actually take to win? We need two lands, we need a creature, a hammer, and a way to equip, so we need five. We would require a perfect hand at five. Yeah, let's just keep this on the strength of the champion. And ship back probably the Mystic Gate, most awkward land. Celia opponent, your name is Bogles. You're not supposed to play wizards. All right, another infect creature. So we are going to put opponent on the clock for actually answering our infect creatures while gaining life. This deck should not have to fight a fair game, though. Oh, it's Mono Red Phoenix. So potentially just dead here. Two phoenixes. And a lava dart. Okay, don't really have an answer to that. So currently on a three turn clock. Well, two after getting hit. Yeah, we don't have that. That is some fast, exciting magic. So Thalia 100% coming in at that point. Silence coming in. Silence is going to be better than the Dispel or the Spell Pierce. Thalia is going to be better than both of those. So I can hit a Manamorphose here and put them off their tempo. Spell Pierce can also hit Faithless Looting. Actually, hitting Faithless Looting on the play might be relevant. Apostles Blessing is significantly less relevant. Uh, the sad thing is that they can win fairly without the Phoenixes hitting the bin, so rest doesn't actually do much. Yeah, I think that's how we're running it. Just need to actually get a better hand. Okay, this is a turn one spell pierce, or actually... So this just needs a hammer to go off as well as interact, so we are 100% keeping this. And I suppose we'll just put opponent to the bolt test first. Mm, I have blue coming in the waist. Yeah, let's just get a basic. I want to keep my life total as high as possible. Next turn gets to be a Cordulus while holding up Spell Pierce. <laughs> All right. Or just a Blighted Agent. Let's actually make them use the removal on the Cordulus. That seems like the best fit. Then if they do start trying to line up for a Phoenix, I can just silence them out of the game. Or out of the turn. Keep the Duelist alive. Then technically if we draw... No, we don't have the win yet. That is very close to the win, though. So, Cigar's Aid means a hammer is lethal in the future, so I actually think I'm going to commit to my Blighted Agent here. And Cordulus can't get in. That's a sad Cordulist. Oh, alright. They are going heavy on the creatures here. Massive fucking hammer. Come on, off the top. I don't ask for a lot, but I do want a massive hammer. Okay. Uh, what are we looking at? If they cast four spells, I'm dead. If they cast three spells and a bolt, I'm dead. They have a single card in hand. Ugh, my time is running out.
So I need a land and a hammer if I want to silence to protect my creatures first. I think this means I'm doing an upkeep stop to try to just stem the bleeding as much as possible. Alright, they're going deep. Yep. You got it, opponent. Another cigar is aid. Alright, well... This outfitter's actually not doing much in hand, so I may as well get some blockers out. And I actually don't think attacking was correct last turn. I could have double blocked a Monastery Swift Spear with the Silence up. And I'm going to hit them for 10 or basically not kill them. Unfortunately, if opponent's holding a bolt, they basically just get it. Nope, exile. Lava dart, a braid. So let's put that there. If opponent has a land, then I'm I've lost anyway. But yeah, I need to block the other one in case they only have a bolt. That's a path. That doesn't really solve anything, so I'm still dead on table. All right, the opponent gets it. That's a little sad. Early versions of this deck also had the Trinket Mage in the deck, so you could just go tutor the hammer, but... What you gonna do? All right, this is a Core Duelist, a Spell Pierce, a Hammer. All I need is a... Sigarda's Aid or a core. If I get a core, I need to land. Yeah, this hand might be a little bit greedy. Here we have, again, we just need a hammer, but this is looking like what we want to keep, so I'm good to keep it. Sending back a land, most of our deck functions on two mana. And I don't actually need the basic. Steam vent, so probably another Phoenix deck. Seeing has how it wasn't a fetch, it could potentially be Storm. If it's Storm, I actually think we have a pretty good matchup just because they're not going to try to interact with us at all. If it is Phoenix, I probably should have led on Giver of Runes, but trying to maximize the one-shot kill, looking more like Storm at this point. Yep, that's a Brawl. That's a Teferi. So this is probably going to be a path. I want to do it on my turn to not add to Storm count. And a Gifts. I mean, sorry, Giver. Thinking Storm. Storm on the mind. Alternatively, I could do a Sigarda's Aid here, but I honestly don't think that the opponent should be interacting. They could potentially have a remand, but Sigarda's Aid costs one. Giver can give protection if they get another blocker. Like that. Wow, do they just have it? They only have three cards in hand. One was blind. Yeah, that, that works. Flooded Strand. All right, so that's kind of a start. We're going to bounce one of the Mana Dorks, just set them back to where they need to be at, and there's not much of a point to attack. They shouldn't have an answer for the Duelist. I would have to tap both of my creatures. That leaves Teferi open to die. Yeah, we'll just stay on defense. So they have the Mana Dork and three Unknowns. Yep. There's Electromancer. This is a Gifts I think we just lose. All right, let's see what you got. 
expecting this to be a ritual ritual passed in flames and probably a manamorphos. I'm not sure if they can get their storm count high enough though. Well, called the pile. Uh, so pass and flames cost more in the yard, and I don't like drawing multiple cards. They already have plenty of mana with the Electromancers. Currently, it looks like they have about storm count seven, but they get a gifts again, so probably have all the mana to kill us. Actually, it's ten with the other rituals in the yard. Next gifts pile gets another Past in Flames. So they do need to have another Past in Flames in deck, which they should, but we'll take a look at the next pile and see where that gets us. Oh, I need to turn off auto yields. Uh, I'm going to give Pro Red now, just because our out is still drawing a whatever it's called, and this way they can't Grape Shot. So they're going to need another Gifts and another Past in Flames. Huh. Do they have the other Past in Flames? All right, bend the cards to draw. And the win condition. Oh, they have the other Past in Flames. All right. You're a good opponent. All right, Thalia comes in. Uh, Uriok Champion can be interesting. Huge fan of Silence on this matchup. Dispel also snags. The Gifts Ungiven. Leyline is good pre-board, but post-board they usually go for Empty the Warren, so Uriok Ch Champion would probably be a little bit better. Pass and Flame shuts off the graveyard, despite the fact they're going to bring in pieces of the puzzle. Uh, we're really going to have to water down our game plan. Marion Crusaders just straight up out. They probably only have one bolt and an abrade. Uh, what's your shot, Link? Yeah, Uriok's not great, but it's I'd be looking at that probably over Leyline. Just because of the whole Gabo game plan. You end up gaining as much life as they come in, and then you're at least putting up a free blocker every turn. I, I don't think they're worth bringing in. Like We need to go for our one-shot kill, and they're not going to be interacting with us fast enough. Uh, definitely trimming on Giver of Runes. I don't mind having a couple because they do block fairly profitably, but um, yeah, maybe just a spell pierce. They get a lot of mana, and we brought in a lot of interaction. We're still just looking for our best win, which it's not been very kind. Like So far, we have not been able to draw into our win condition very easily. Uh, this is a Cigar to Zaid, a Thalia. We have interaction and something stop them mid combo so sure we've been mulliganing pretty aggressively and it has not been paying off so i'll keep something playable this time around this means thalia gets to come down should make life a little difficult for them uh, Brad Wanda was telling me that I should put Thick Thalia in here, but I figured three mana for the 3-2 just wasn't relevant enough. Like, Mirian Crusader being double strike, and especially running the sort of Fire and Ice, like... <laughs> oh yeah, Thalia with a massive fucking hammer would just be delightful. 12-11. Alright, well... Opponent left up one mana for an opt, so they get to do it for Thalia. If they left it up for a bolt, they're going to be mildly disappointed. <laughs> All right. Bolt my Thalia, I dare you. So if they don't do anything, I actually might silence them here just because... Oh, Thalia makes it cost more. Yeah, that doesn't work. All right, we're just going to hammer. If you bolt me, I'm going to be super sad, opponent. Like, so sad.
And we thought 3-2 Thalia was thick. <laughs> What's a 12-11 Thalia? Oh, that's so aggravating. <laughs> All right, so we need to find a Teferi to bounce the hammer, or we need to find a... Oh, my chat disappeared. Yeah, my, uh, my stuff is not lined up at all. <sighs> I just want to do fun things. Is that really so hard? Alright, well, that's an ink moth. So, an, a core will do it. A core outfitter should be able to get us there. And definitely going to path during their upkeep. I don't want to give them the mana this time around. They shouldn't be able to kill us here, so. Okay to go for it now. It's possible that they just, like, ritual into a gifts. Or actually just fire off a gifts. I wouldn't be surprised if they just go for a value gifts here. Opponent, we had hopes and dreams. Why did you have to take them away? Wow. And uh, apparently our deck wants us to draw all of our mana. So I actually don't want to activate the Sync Moth Nexus. Again, we're going for a one-shot kill here, and it's probably going to be better off just not swinging for one every turn. All right, ritualing into something. Just the pieces of the puzzle, that's fine. Gets rid of a dismember. Come on, one more writ. Bam! So they grabbed and empty the warrens here, which is why I'm silencing now. It's going to shut off the storm count. And empty just a bunch of cards out of their hand. Uh, it's possible they would have tried to go for more, but that was literally every card that they had shown us so far, so definitely wanted to fire it off then. Equip 8. We're getting dangerously close to Equip 8. Well, given the fact that we've seen 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 8 of our 22 lands in the top 13... Yeah, I need to have a creature, though. If I top deck something like a Thalia, it means I do get to put Colossus Hammer on her, but I'm drawing lands! Ugh. It's a bad deck. Bad. Apparently, my deck thought that I wanted the 8 mana to equip the hammer. I need 10 to put it on Ink Moth Nexus. For shame, deck, for shame. I stopped keeping track of what opponent's doing. They basically just have it. We flooded out insanely hard. We drew three non-lands. And I think... Five. Sorry, we had five. Oh, look at the little empty. This is a remand? No. Okay. They're just going for it. All right. Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> All right. So five, six, seven. So actually six, seven, eight. Uh, if I draw a creature next turn, I'll hit eight mana. If I don't, I have nine. 
So I'll survive two turns. I can't block with Ink Moth yet. If I top deck another land, I can actually kill with Ink, Mo Ink Moth the following turn. This is when we need to pull up the hypergeometric calculator, though. So population size, 60. We have 22 lands. Our sample size is 16. And how many successes have we had? We've had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 0 0.0027. Ah, I feel like that happens to me a lot, like a whole lot. Leaving one goblin back? Are they expecting a hasty creature? Okay, um, let's let's go ahead and bump this up to twelve. Point zero. <laughs> Actually, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So yeah, next turn I can one shot them. <laughs> oh, they're leaving the goblin back because the ink moth is going to lose flying. Yeah, so that line doesn't even work. But that line does. All right, so this should be a win. My boy Teferi does not lead to interesting magic. But my boy Teferi can win the game. So Teferi comes down. I'll still have three mana. I won't be able to activate Ink Moth if they remand again. All right. Pick that up. I should have played the land before just for the rubbins for opponent. Just that they knew how many lands we drew. So this is an awesome play right here because what gets to happen is I get to attack in with Flying. And then Sigarda's aid gives my equipment flash. So after they don't block, before damage, I get to equip the hammer that takes down the flying. And then it will be a one-shot kill. So the, yeah, I mean, they can't interact because Teferi's out. Uh, look at how sexy that was. Massive fucking hammer. All right, does that mean I actually want the Giver of Runes? If they're going to go for a small empty, to be fair, I did silence him in the middle of the empty, but if they go for a small empty, Giver actually stops that and also protect against Bolt. So I think I probably want those. Maybe the Rip's not as important or the Path. Sure, let's do that. I mean, the odds. The odds were not in our favor. Uh, this is one piece of our combo, but it's multiple pieces of hate. We're here to do stupid things. We can't play a fair game. We have a cigar to aid, a core outfitter, a fair piece of equipment, a blighted agent. No mana to do it, though. So this is a turn one cigar to aid. We have two turns to draw land. That's going to be a blighted agent with a sort of fire and ice. And that's going to be lethal in three turns. So this is a turn five kill. And we have hate. Yeah, we'll give this a shot. So we're going to put that on bottom and call it a day. After all, after how many lands we drew last game? Yep, I knew our deck would pull through. So let's go get a hollowed fountain. Cigar to aid. We even got an Ink Moth Nexus. Okay, so that's pretty impressive. We have another win condition lined up. Opponent, did you keep a bolt? Oh, you're going to remand me, aren't you? Apparently not. Tap out, tap out. For an Electromancer, preferably. I mean, I'm not going to tell you how to do your job, but if you do an Electromancer and I 
get the opportunity to do a free sword of fire and ice. Kill the Electromancer. <laughs> All right. Oh, boy. Well, this is fine. They're not going to be able to interact with Thalia, and then I'll end up having my Spell Pierce ready if they do end up killing her on their turn. So they can't kill her and then just combo, although they're likely missing a lot of mana for that. Four mana here might just be a pieces of the puzzle. Hmm, okay. So I can technically sort of fire and ice, but I probably want to do that to protect Thalia. Yeah, I think I'm going to use it to save her from a bolt. It sucks being responsible. Do you have another bolt? Your man won't get you out of this. If this resolves, I have a permathalia. Bam! Protection from your deck. <laughs> uh, so the lightning bolt's red. Sword of Fire and Ice gives the creature protection from red because it has protection it can't be targeted by, so it gets countered by game rolls. <laughs> now we have a Spell Pierce and a Silence stapled to a permanent Thalia that can't be blocked. I like this. Uh, Brawl negates Thalia to a point. But, uh, let's actually just make some damage happen. Between Spell Pierce and Silence, we're probably okay here. Fortunately, the sword can't kill Baral, but... Uh, I should have done that with Hollowed Fountain. Odds are I'm not going to have to silence here. I just took one damage for no reason. Shoot you for two more. Draw an additional card. I'm actually okay with the land. <sighs> so, opponent ends up running a gifts package with a lot of singletons in it. The Lightning Bolt and the Abrade are both tutorable, which means they probably have like a Shattering Spree in hand, just because it's a different name. If I end up casting the Rest in Peace here, it's going to shut off... Whatever, let's just have Silence. If they try to Rest in Peace, we can Silence, and if not, we'll just untap and Rest in Peace and still hold up Silence. They're running out of cards in hand. They have two turns before they're down, like... Our equipment's actually putting in some damage here. I mean, it's not a massive fucking hammer, but it is a sort of fire and ice. Alright, Ink Moth doesn't really do anything productive. Let's go ahead and rip. I probably should have attacked with Thalia first, just because this is going to let me see an additional card, and I may not have wanted to rip depending on what I top deck. I'm feeling fairly confident at this moment, though. Ah, pay costs. Did you find something? Uh, I got an Echoing Truth. Yeah, so that was another reason not to play the Rest in Peace, because that would have meant I could replay Sword of Fire and Ice. Now... That means that Thalia can die to the Baral. Yep, that's painful. Well played, opponent. <sighs> well, with the rip out, it does mean that they probably can't just kill us here. It's possible, but they're going to have to run really well. I didn't do that right. 
So they got rid of the spiral buff, the metamorphosis, and the desperate ritual. Here's the peer through the depths. Oh, they did have another desperate ritual. Okay, they just revealed two. So if they ritual here, that's when I'm going to silence, just because it means that they are trying to actually get up their count. So right now, storm count should be two, but this would mean that they're tapping out. So sad that they killed Mythalia. We needed a hammer. I can't imagine it was correct to silence them before I attacked. Maybe on the following turn to actually prompt the Echoing Truth. Uh, I was just all playing the rep pre-combat. All right, opponent's trying to figure out if they're going for it, which means if they do tap out, 100% silencing because they think they found a way to do it. Let them do the hard work, just know what your counter is and play to the best line. So what do I want to draw? I think I just want to draw a hammer off the top. Hammer off the top means I'm one-shotting with Ink Moth Nexus. So how much mana do I actually have here? I'm going to pay one for Ink Moth Nexus. I'll have three available. So I'm going to be able to attack in with two Ink Moths. One with Sword of Fire and Ice, putting them on a two-turn clock. Ink Moth becomes a creature. Oh, sorry. Didn't realize I covered his life. I meant to just cover his name. That That's better. Okay, and then activate, still have three mana left. Or, actually, I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to be doing is hitting and trying to draw into a better card. Yeah, that was horrible. Thank you for pointing that out, Link. Should have done that a while ago. Are you freaking kidding me? So I think we untap and die. Do I need to pull out the math again? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten out of seventeen. So we had that before. Okay, it's not nearly as bad as last game, but it's still going to be very improbable. Two percent chance. And they did the math last turn, which means that they uh, pretty much have us dead. It's possible they have to do it through Empty the Warrens, though, and not Grape Shot, since they already used a Grape Shot to get rid of our Blighted Agent on turn two. Yeah, that's actually not that bad. So that does put us dead in two turns, but basically any equipment's still going to let us win, and they have to be holding removal. They used Manamorphos, they used Desperate Rit. Giver of Runes is a pretty decent blocker. Now the question is, am I going to be going for a goblin token here to lower the clock on myself, or am I going to hit them and have them dead to both infect and regular damage? So if I hit them, I basically have to hit for three more attacks versus poisoning for for next turn? No, I'm going to go for poison next turn, so we'll hit a goblin. Hopefully draw into some good action. Good action will solve all problems. I 
I should update the record. We're currently one and one versus Storm, and down a game versus I can't even remember what game one was. Okay, uh, so this is going to be eighteen. This is going to be eleven. One point one percent. Shenanigans, people. Shenanigans. I just want a massive fucking hammer. Is that so much to ask for? Oh, I actually probably should have hit them last game or last turn because I'd put them dead to the giver trigger to the giver attack. Giver would have been lethal with uh, three damage as opposed to just getting an additional poison. Oh, well, we'll have them dead two different ways here, so. This means Baral can't get in, so they should only swing in with the five goblins. Going to eat one of them. I mean, still in a pretty decent spot. Just not everywhere I want to be at. Giver does make sure I'm getting through for lethal, though, off the Ink Moth. Just because I can give Pro whatever color to the one that he tries to attack. Did that to draw a card. Electromancer means the one spell in hand costs significantly less than he wants it to. And just scoops it up. If I would have drawn a land for turn, I want to see it. Yeah, I still win next turn. So I'd end up putting the sword on one of the ink moths and attacking with all three. If he had any interaction with a single card, I'd just make it pro bolt, essentially, and get in for lethal. I, I want to see my next card. Screw you, game. Screw you. All right, well, we do end up moving to one-to-one. -one. Little surprise we beat Storm. Should have actually beat Mono Red Phoenix, but what can you do? Storm even had the Echo Intro Thea Braid and the Lightning Bolt in Game 3, and we still took it. And uh, we had some, some horrible probability going for us. Absolutely horrible. Yeah, but like 22 lands should not be overkill when four of them are infect creatures that are going to swing out for lethal with your game plan on a single turn. Like, that's like running 18 lands. I mean, by that logic, I should actually probably be doing this. I would have had eight successes because three were Ink Moth Nexuses making them creatures and we're closer to 29%. But like, what the F? Like, it should not be that bad. And in the match versus Mono Red Phoenix, we got Mana Screwed. All right, so I'm 100% keeping this because I have a Giver of Runes, and against Mono Red Phoenix in the very first game, we did just slam a 10, or an 11-12 Giver of Runes, and we won the game. A Sigarda's Aid from here, or Core, is actually lethal, and it looks like Valakut, maybe Junt, Ponza, some number of the things above. All right, Sword of Fire and Ice is mildly awkward. So what do I do here? Do I just go get a basic, expecting a Blood Moon? Do I path the Arbor Elf so that they can't have four mana next turn? Do I just run out the Giver off of a basic? I think that's probably my best line. And that way, if they have Blood Moon, I'm not screwed. If they have Stone Rain, then I'll just see Crumb Coast and path the Giver. Oh, so they don't have a second land? They're going to... Okay, I don't know what's happening. That... They just missed out on two mana? Oh, boy. Apostle's Blessing. So, I know I'm playing my only planes... 
or my only land. I kind of want to hold up path here. I kind of actually want to put a hammer out on the battlefield, so if I draw a core, I can just cast it. But opponent's looking at six mana next turn if I don't do anything. If I path and they draw land, they're still looking at six mana, so I'd have to path on upkeep. Blighted Agent could do something, but they should have a number of bolts. Um, Sword and Fire and Ice can't even come out yet. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tap the planes, incentivizing a Stone Rain to hit my non-basic because it's untapped and put out a Colossal Hammer. And then he could be Tooth and Nell. It's not unheard of. The deck hasn't seen much play in a bit, but... I think I have to see if he's doing Inferno Titan. If he's doing Inferno Titan, I can Apostles Blessing. Stone Rain. All right, float the white. Wow. Okay. I'd like to stay in this game. It's not looking very likely, but I'd like to stay in this game. Hey, look at that. That's kind of how you do it. Uh, I am kind of afraid of Blood Moon. What other blue stuff do I have in my deck? So more Blighted Agent, Spell Pierce to Fairy. Yeah, I think I'm actually just going to get a non-basic. My life total shouldn't matter at this point, and just being able to get out my Blighted Agent here is going to be important. If they incentivize Blood Moon, then I've already got a basic for this, but them having six mana, seven mana, and three cards in hand probably means I'm not going to do anything overly productive. Okay. Still drawing live to a cigar to Zade for whatever it's worth. Yep, that hurts. So what is my line here? Opponent only has one card in hand, which means that they're probably running out of gas. I've got a top deck for two turns in a row. If I do, they'll turn Chandra on but I have an Apostle's Blessing to try to protect the creature. If opponent has anything, I'm probably good to scoop. Yeah, wow, they just had the Nutter Butters there. All right, and basically all land destruction is sorcery, so those spells don't do anything. Uh, Thalia is probably going to hurt me more than them. Well, Marian Crusaders are awful here. Probably want... I don't even think I want anything. I guess I can bring this in, but getting the double white's going to be hard. Being pro red, like, <sighs> wow. Pillage hurt. Pillage really hurt. I really only need two mana to go off, which means I should be able to kill them very fast with a decent hand. Uh, I guess I could silence if I'm expecting something coming that's probably better than the champion. I can just silence them off a turn and actually get a free turn without land destruction. Uh, this is a Sigardazade, an infect creature that's a land, and no disruption. This is a turn one giver of runes, turn two sort of fire and ice. I mean, that's slightly better than what I've had. Core Outfitters, redundant. Wow. Three land destruction spells. That was painful. And after getting flooded so bad versus Storm. All right, so... Flooded Strand's going to be the best here. Can go get a basic if that's their game plan. Then I don't have another creature, so Giver gets to attack in for free.
Don't have the Utopia Sprawl. I honestly don't think that's too much to ask. Just don't have it. Like, even Blood Moon's kind of okay here. I'll go get a basic, then sort of fire and ice, blow up the Arbor Elf. That's a start. Massive fucking hammer off the top. That's a basic, and that's a basic basic we're squatting on. Alright, so Giver is now pro red. Blow up the Arbor Elf. And you thought you were the land destruction deck. I suppose drawing another land is an awful. But Pillage is going to have to be pointed at sort of Fire and Ice right now. Yep. Where are my hammers? <laughs> I had one Golden Knight, and that was just a massive fucking hammer. That's not a massive fucking hammer. Uh, so it's probably more correct to do this during their upkeep. I want to... Does hitting for one actually accomplish anything here? Because hammer's going to make anything an 11. I just need to make sure to do it before combat, and ramping them into a Chandra is probably super bad. They already have their green source, so I don't have to worry about fixing them. And they have another Rabble Master. I, I just don't have words at this point. <laughs> I can't tell if the deck's trying to be good to me or bad to me, because... Like, we're playing against a land destruction deck. They gave me all four basics. They gave me multiple lands to get around all of the basics. Now I'm dead on the crackback. So, I need massive fucking hammer this turn. I'm saving the Apostles' Blessings that I can get in unblocked. There we go. So, I need to do Pro Red first. And they don't have anything. There we go. Deck, you're making me sweat tonight. We're going down to the wire every opportunity we get. All right, so Thalia on the draw is probably actively worse than on the play, and I didn't even want her on the play. Now that I've seen the Rabble Master, Uriok Champion's looking mildly more interesting, but still probably not worth it. I just have so many unblockable creatures. Uh, actually, seeing those, I probably want those over silences. Silences can buy me a turn versus land destruction, but that's just buying a turn and not doing anything productive. Uh, Ariok Champion can continuously block. Like, they'll still generate tokens, but I'll gain life every time a token enters and just drastically give me some time. Uh, this is a Spell Pierce on the Blood Moon on turn 2, or the Land Destruction. That's a Blighted Agent, as well as Protection. 
I don't have a hammer. I don't have a way to cheat the hammer into play. I think I just have too many redundant pieces and the path isn't great here. This is significantly better. So tuck the cigar to Zade. Look at that, a turn you didn't start off with a Arbor Elf. Still going to be a turn two Blood Moon, but I have a Spell Pierce for that. Honestly, the Blood Moon's not that bad. I just don't want Pillage here. Or Stone Rain, but that's fine. That's why we have a Spell Pierce. We're good at this game. Alright, Blighted Agent is going to require the one blue source I have active. I'm going to use the Hollowed Found in case they have another land destruction. It won't be hitting my basic. Then top decking a hammer and them not having a bolt should be lethal. If Blighted Agent dodges removal this turn, then... Alright, that's a Blood Braid into a Utopia Sprawl. That means I can at least protect it with the Apostle's Blessing. to Chandra. A Thunder Ma Hellkite. That actually really hurts my deck. That's a redundant cigar to Zade. So I really don't want to expose this planes unless I have to. Do I want to path the Bloodbraid Elf? Probably not. And they've got another one. There's a Blood Moon. Yep, that's all fine. That's why I kept the planes. Probably actually should have floated a widened path one of the Blood Braids. Actually, by that same logic, I probably should have just played a planes and actually pathed one of the Blood Braids. Now I'm going to be dead to a... Lightning Bolt. Although Lightning Bolt would have been pointed at Blighted Agent, I guess I'm dead to another Bloodbraid Elf. Wow. Okay, opponent, you're going deep. So this play is going to leave me at one, required me to top deck a massive fucking hammer. Target creature, pay two. We're gonna give it pro red. Block one of the blood braids, take six. Top deck a massive fucking hammer. That's not a massive fucking hammer. All right, well, let's move on. Let's take a look at how far down it would have been. Yeah, that's heartbreaking. All right, well, move to 1-2. Uh, anyone familiar with my streams knows that this is a 2-3 bracket. Sorry. Yeah, king of the 2-3 bracket. Take piles in, usually go 2-3. Usually not the best, but given the fact that we're playing this just because we want to play a massive fucking hammer, it kind of makes sense. So on track for that, we can still actually cash out. We can do some fun stuff there, but... Yeah, I mean, we're basically just looking for the hammer. Um, so the card that I was using before, I actually can't remember the exact name of it. I think it's Ogre's Cleaver. I know it's a cleaver. Yep, two mana plus five plus O. Oh. I was trying to play with that in Core Duelist with Mutagenic Growths, and it wasn't even remotely close. Every time I tried to play test it, it was just beyond awful, like so bad. But Massive Hammer should have actually been able to get there. Yeah, so this hand is actually turn one Giver of Runes, turn two Colossus Hammer, turn three Core Outfitter. These Marion Crusaders have been incredibly awkward. Just the fact that it already had Double Strike and it had relevant protection 
felt like it was worth having. I love this card. It's been fantastic. I've hit it off of Coco's to win games before, but I don't know if this is the right shell for it. It would obviously be fantastic if we had a Stoneforge Mystic, and like it wouldn't even be that broken, but we could at least go Tutor the Hammer. We could have the backup plan of Batter Skull so we wouldn't have just gotten wrecked by Mono Red Phoenix. Like... There's definitely some possibilities there. And it's Tron. So we actually do have a possibility of killing our opponent here. <laughs> All right, unless it's uh, E-Tron. That's fun. So this is going to be a Colossus Hammer, and then the following turn is Core Outfitter, attach itself, then Apostle's Blessing for pro colorless, and hopefully just kill them. Uh, with it being E-Tron, I think I do actually want to get a Hollowed Fountain, just that I have both whites for my Core Outfitter, and I messed up. I should have done that. Tapped at their instep. Oh well. We have our third mana now, which means we can use Core Outfitter to protect it from Dismember. And honestly, if they pay the life for it, we'll actually just kill them in response. So that's that's fun. Should be a Mattery Shaper. So I do have to cautiously take this turn thinking about what a Thought Knot Seer could take from me. Oh, that's that's brutal. All right, Core Outfitter, show why you're valuable. I have a 12-12. What do you have? I'm going to leave the Apostle's Blessing up. I can't think of anything for four mana that can kill me here, but I do want to be cautious of it. Yep, as expected, the Thought Knots here. Uh, they probably have to take the Mirian Crusader. This might also just be a Knowledge Thought Knots here, just trying to figure out what the heck is going on over here. That Apostle's Blessing was going to potentially help us cheese a kill out, but... Oh well. Uh, attack with the Mattery Shaper, top deck it to Fairy. My hopes and dreams. I must just want too much. They took the Cigar to Zade. Okay. I mean, it was probably the most threatening looking. But Apostle's Blessing can 100% cheese a kill here. And Marion Crusader is just a threat that can also cheese a kill, as well as just be threatening. And that's an Ink Moth, so we can kill them next. No, we don't have another way to equip. Alright, Core Outfitter, get some, get some deeps in. What I am expecting to happen is for them to hit their last Eldrazi Tron and all is dust, because that's just how my life seems to be going lately. Can't play fun brews because they just hit all the fun things. Tower's going to come into play. Now they're actually going to have Nulamog mana, so just a lot of problems across the board. Opponent knows their hands, so they're just going to run it out. Core Outfitter is actually lethal too. I'll just Core Outfitter, move the Colossus Hammer to the... Fun. Marion Crusader, give Pro Colorless. So, Reality Smasher. That's fine. 
When your Thought Knot tier is on chump block duty, you're not in a great place. Cycling the Mind Stone, makes sense. Probably looking for a Karn here because Karn could animate the Colossus Hammer and make it fall off. Wow, just going deep. Yep, you get in for five. Not even going to remotely try to challenge that. Would you like to move past combat? We're both tapped out. No blocks. Core Outfitter, please. I knew that was asking too much. So we have shown that we can draw all of the lands in our deck multiple games over and over again. So I'm going to run out the land. Uh, Colossus Hammer basically means I have to swing in here. They're going to block with the matter reshaper, which means like nothing happens, but the hammer isn't really doing a whole lot for me on defense. They technically have better top decks than me, and they have Tron active, which means like a hanger backwalker is pretty lethal. They found another matter reshaper. All right. I'm considering trading off my Ink Moth Nexus and the Marion Crusader for the Reality Smasher. It's still going to trample a little bit through, but it's going to apply enough pressure that... Okay, this can't be good. Alright, that's the would have been lethal Hanger Back Walker. So... Yeah, I don't even think the core outfitter does it anymore. Let's see, so I can block the Thought Knots here. They're going to have to pop the Hanger Back Walker, or I'll draw a card. Oh, I just punted. I'm going to lose off of that. Yep, we're good. We're moving to the next game. And your back walker can just shoot me for the rest of it. Uh, I don't have stony silence. That's awkward. Wow, I don't have anything for this. All right, let's just be faster. It's kind of sad when a 12-12 can't beat Eldrazi Tron. Massive fucking hammer, not going the distance. Hangerback Walker is just going to absolutely wreck our deck. Yeah, definitely needed a number of Stony Silences in the deck. Like, there's nothing even bad I want to take out. Apostle's Blessing and Giver of Runes both give protection from Colorless. If they didn't have Dismember on turn one for the Giver of Runes, that would have been a completely different story. I would have just attacked in unblocked. This is not a creature or a free way to equip, so we got to get rid of it. This is no mana. That's a gorgeous hand, though, if I had mana. Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, this is a Giver of Runes to eat the first removal spell, a Core Duelist, and a Core Outfitter. So I got to ship back an Apostle's Blessing and a land. The colorless land. But a hammer off the top will make this lethal, so we'll see what we can do. Also see if they have dismember again. That dismember was just a hundred percent won them the game. And we do not have a great sideboard. All right, that's an expedition map. Oh, giving protection from colorless means that my equipment's gonna fall off. All right, well, I'm just going all out. 
By the time that they can thought not here, I want to make sure I have an empty hand. And honestly, having two core duelists makes it so that the giver of runes isn't nearly as good. I don't need to protect just one of them, so... Uh, if I draw a hammer, I need a land, too. And I'm at least two turns away. Chalice of the Void on one. That shuts off my hammer. Doesn't shut off sort of fire and ice, and Teferi can bounce it. Although, the way this is going, I might just have the fair beatdown plan win. And just put some power out. So, they can't crack Expedition Map yet. A Thought Knot can potentially come down if they just naturally have an Eldrazi land. Eldrazi Temple, whatever it's called. In the meantime, I can just cast Sword of Fire and Ice, put it on the Core Outfitter, make it a 4-4. Reality Smasher is going to shut down my entire game plan, too. Not a fan of this. So they were about to Thought Knot, and then they realized that they wouldn't be taking a card, so they didn't want to actually do it. So here's a Matter Reshaper. Yep. So I think I want to draw a Teferi off the top. Alternatively, the Marian Crusader is a real clock. Blighted Agent, not so much. Well, opponent knows what we got going on, so I'm not even going to try to bluff it. We had a path, we couldn't get through the chalice, so. Planet, these are my white weenies. What do you think of them? I mean, it's definitely putting them on the back foot, but it's not like it's doing anything amazing. Core Duelist, even getting Double Strike with Sword of Fire and Ice isn't going to go very far. Cracking the Expedition map, going to go get uh, probably Tron Land? Maybe a Blast Zone. It's going to be a Blast Zone. Oh, nope, Tron Land. All right. So that means another Matter Reshaper. All right, no, Mimic. Or just a slow rolled mind stone. That works. Opponent currently has four mana, which means a 2 2 walking ballista. I'm just finding more lands. Hitting my opponent for five is not relevant unless I draw Sword of Fire and Ice. The Blighted Agent's not really doing much for me at the moment, but. It's not like it's going to be blocking a Reality Smasher. Actually, now that they have six mana, it might be blocking a Reality Smasher. Okay, well, I do want to get to five mana for Sword of Fire and Ice, so I'm definitely playing the land. And what I think I'm doing is I'm going to hit for four and leave back the Blighted Agent, so if a Reality Smasher comes down, they'll still have to assign one point of damage to it, but I'll make it a 4-4. Four, four and just start slowly shrinking it if they try to attack with it. Odds are at this board state, though, they're going to have to leave it on defense. I'm really surprised they just didn't get a blast zone and blow up three-fifths of my board. Inbringer? That's about as bad as it gets. 
All right, I needed to ferry. And Bringer's gonna clear all of my little dudes, making sure that my two-two can attack. Wow, that is painful. So, and Bringer's gonna start picking off the duelists, so I still have to attack in with them, just so I actually get benefit from what I'm doing. I guess it was also correct to attack in with the Blighted Agent there. The additional one point of damage with a Ink Moth would have meant that three hits with a Sword of Fire and Ice would have been lethal with the additional one from that single attack where he can just kill my blighted agent and still hit with rally smasher now yeah falling so far behind another inbringer So, that means a Cordulus is going down this turn, a Cordulus is going down on my turn, and then Giver of Runes is going down, and then I won't be able to keep a board state. So, this is my last turn to draw something productive. What do I even care about at this point? Oh, this is an old list too. It doesn't have a Basilisk Collar in it anymore. Or the Hangerback Walkers. Wow, how did I take a screenshot of a list from, like, yesterday morning? Alright, Sword of Fire and Ice or Teferi. That's a path that doesn't do anything. Alright, well, there's no point in continuing. They're just going to kill every, my entire board state after this. And I had nothing productive coming. All right, moving up to the 1-3 bracket. So we are going to play the last one. Uh, it's not really at a point where we're going to bell and try to do something different, but we can potentially steal the last one. And I mean, who was here to win? I, I thought we were here for the massive fucking hammer. So we'll go ahead and continue doing that. Let me see if I can pull up my new list because the deck view is definitely out of date. Let's see how. Yeah, so we have Teferi instead of the Hangerback Walkers. We ended up adding Path to Exiles for the Basilisk Collar and the other Hangerback Walker. And cleaned up the mana base a little bit. It's honestly not too different, but it is a little different. Oh, my bad opponent. Did not hear the trigger go off. Uh, YouTube's asked me to turn off the MTGO sound, so I turned him really, really, really far down, and I didn't hear that one. Let's see. Single colorless land. No combo. No keep. Three blighted agents. <laughs> oh. All right, well. Deck is definitely telling me what it thinks about me tonight. Sure, we'll keep this. We only have one mana, so we can send that back. And I guess the redundant creature. That's an interesting Runescard Demon. Yeah, I'm used to that art. Oh, that must be an MTG only promo. Alright, so we're playing against Prison. This, oddly enough, is probably one of the few matches that we're just going to absolutely dominate if we have a keepable hand. This is going to be Ghostly Prisons, Ley Lines, and the like. It's 
So I am expecting a Blood Moon here, not this turn, but the following turn. Uh, also expecting an Enduring Ideal. Or not, well, I am expecting an Enduring Ideal, but I meant Suppression Field. <laughs> On Thin Ice. All right, well, that's cute. That technically works. Let's see here. So I'm expecting a Blood Moon to come down, which means I have to spell Pierce it. Uh, if not, I have to spell Pierce the Enduring Ideal off the Lotus Bloom. But seeing as how I don't have a basic, if they Blood Moon here, I guess I could path and go get an Island. But then that means I'm doing absolutely nothing for the foreseeable future. Well, they had a tap land, which means I probably am going to snag an Enduring Ideal with an untap land next turn. Wow. And uh, already a minute and a half behind on clock is the Prison Player. This is going to be a really slow match. Opponent, I would like to take my turn. You're in your instep. That's actually just an island. So I am just attacking and I need to draw into two combo pieces. But if I spell pierce to the opponent's combo, then that means that they're gonna be set back pretty far too. I'm expecting a blood moon out of them, but doesn't mean that it's gonna be coming anytime soon. Yep, you get your Lotus Bloom. Untap land means that you get to cast Enduring Ideal. That's a ghostly prison, that's fine. I've apparently drawn a lot of mana. So opponent is slow rolling it. And by slow rolling it, I mean they're two and a half minutes behind on clock. On Thin Ice actually gives this a lot of legs because the other card that they run is Sphere of Safety where you have to pay X to attack where X is the number of enchantments that you control and that's effectively an additional enchantment so it's another effect for Ghostly Prison. Well, the Ghostly Prison effect in Sphere of Safety. Pay two to attack for one. Prison player must be in heaven. On the plus side, we care about one-shotting our opponent, which means that we only need a single turn to attack. That's a Heliod. Okay, so they can start paying four to make enchantment creatures. Funny enough, can't get spell pierced if I, despite the fact it's not a creature. Uh, if it does become a creature, I can path it, which should be good. I'm going to have to figure out how to get protection to swing through a bunch of little blockers on the ground anyway. So now I'm looking for three pieces. Opponent might be getting a I'm bored out of my mind concession. So if I can get them to crack the Lotus Bloom here for a single token, 
I'll be ahead. If not, it means that they are trying to save up for a big mana turn. I really cannot fault anybody if they just fast forward through this because this is moving so slow. We were supposed to have a massive fucking hammer and one shot them. But I'm top decking lands again. Slimnity. Do I care? I care for my infect kill, but I can't double spell pierce it anyway. That's an Apostle's Blessing, which means I am still just looking for a hammer and a free equip. They'd still have to crack the Lotus Bloom, so I'm still swinging in. Sword of Fire and Ice would be representing 10 damage, so I am still at least two turns away from killing with that. Although Sword of Fire and Ice would just be equipped this turn, it wouldn't even be... Wow, like this was such a horrible start for them too, but we had to mull to five and we were just missing so much. Okay, this time around they get the free token, so I'm not attacking. I don't want to have to use a path or a Apostle's Blessing to protect my core duelist. Jeez, and it's so sad that like I'm looking at a timeout kill in round one just because they have done nothing. They're playing an insanely slow deck and they are falling so far behind on clock. Please, opponent, would you please pick it up? I'm getting so bored over here. Start attacking again next turn because Giver will make my core duelist pro-white, so the tokens won't do anything. Wow, 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 wow. What is the current enchantment math here? One, two, three, four. So Sphere of Safety is I'm going to have to pay five to attack. So I need to draw two cards to turn on my combo. And then I have to pay five currently to swing in through it. Uh, I actually kind of want to just kill the token. I don't know, I guess if they're making two, I probably just want to have this go unblocked. They are getting to the point that they can start swinging back, so I probably got to stay on defense now. So boring. Pro white. Yeah, the Vigilance makes this awkward. I probably should just planned on staying on defense. Nick Thos is making it so that the spell pierces are just incredibly awful. Um, what are they taking here? I probably actually have to Apostles Blessing it. Yeah, Giver of Runes is going to allow me to attack in on block, so I got to save this guy. Any special effects that this has? Not really, so I can just path now. They'll be able to make a couple of more tokens, but then it's out of here.
Opponent has no cards left in hand, though. I would adore drawing an actual piece of threat. Yep, then you get one more activation off the Nykthos. Or you don't want it. All right, so while well, opponent takes 20 minutes to understand that I have F6, I'm gonna just double check. I'm pretty sure that I don't deal minus one, minus one counters, which means I just don't deal damage with Slimnity out. I am just double checking though. I've never actually ran into that interaction. Most of the time I see Slimnity, it's in an unfair manner. Not attacking. So they can hit for six, they can hit for four, and then they can hit for two. But that leaves me still very alive versus the very slow deck. Okay, so that's Wither. Has no effect. Yeah, so in fact, doesn't matter either. Funny enough, opponents probably trying to stay on defense at this point. They're trying to go long and we're on turn 10. Like they're definitely getting what they want out of their deck. Eventually they're gonna try to endure an ideal. Hmm. Yeah, they lost vigilance because Helid's gone. I didn't think about that. There's your pro white. So running out blighted agent into the solemnity means I'm just not gonna die, or it's not gonna do anything, so may as well not show it. Uh, they are probably planning on doing the solemnity lock, which means that I'm gonna have to win them out by milling or by bouncing the Phyrexian Unlife with Teferi. Okay, this is just starting to get aggravating. Should have done that pre-combat. Would have required me having another Apostle's Blessing. And if you had activated Heliod off the Nykthos, I actually would have been dead on board. So, I mean, I should just give you this, but I have the feeling I'm going to draw into my combo and kill you out of nowhere. And that's a pretty decent start to it. Uh, I have seven mana, which means that if I Colossus Hammer and top deck a Sigarda eight, I'm going to feel like an idiot. But if I Colossus Hammer and top deck a land, it's lethal. So I think I need to do that. It also means I'm taking beats from all of the clerics this turn. And just trying to top deck a land. So land puts me on... 12 of 44 versus 4 of 44. I think opponent figured out what I'm trying to do, though. Uh, okay, so if they leave back a single cleric, then they have me dead in three turns, which means I'm winning the race. If they attack in with all three, I should just have lethal. Oh, no, I punted because I'm going to have to pay two for the ghostly prison, which means I have to block here. Blocking here puts me on a three-turn clock, which means I top deck a creature and a land. Or, you know, just a, a core outfitter. The good old two for one. By showing the Colossus Hammer, I think I am a little bit weaker, though, since I can't pay for the Ghostly Prison. All 
All right, a little surprised opponent remember the ghostly prism because I clearly forgot about it. All right, I got two more turns. If I draw a creature, it's four more? No, just three more. Like a Marion Crusader would be pretty awesome here. Jeez, even a Teferi would be great. And they tap the Nykthos. Let's see if they activate the Nykthos in response. If they just tap it for mana, then the other Spell Pierce will still snag it and I'm still drawing live. Right now, Nykthos is giving one, two, three, four, five mana. So they actually need to filter into Nykthos. Can't imagine they see that line, but at least the way that they've been playing. And they didn't. So Enduring Ideal here was likely going to go get Phyrexian Unlife. It also could have gone and got Form of the Dragon. I need a card in front of that. Uh, people have also been using... <laughs> I could have killed them this turn. All right, so I think I'm dead. Now, I still have the line of drawing into a Teferi, bouncing one of their tokens, and then drawing into a creature. Wow, that is brutal. If I wouldn't have blocked, what would have happened was... Actually, no, I made that decision two turns ago, so this is actually two turns too slow, but I could have actually had the Colossus Hammer in hand, run out the Cigar to Zade, made the core a 11-11 double striker and just killed them. But now I have a single turn, which requires the Teferi. Yeah, my overlay's old too. Uh, I don't have the Walking Ballistas. A Walking Ballista would be great here. I almost put Field of Ruin in this deck. It really wouldn't help with the On Thin Ices, but I almost did. Disenchant was also a decent consideration just because there has been a good number of enchantments running around. And I figured having a massive fucking hammer, I would hate to see a disenchant, so I should probably bring one. Oh, yeah, this deck doesn't want a Stony Silence. I don't know what I was thinking. Stony Silence would have made it so that I can't equip my equipment. So I would have to do it through a Cigar Desade or a Core Outfitter. Which only really matters for the sort of Fire and Ice. I don't know. There's probably somebody that actually knows what they're doing that would have insight into that. Okay, do I have to do this again though? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of 17. Uh, it's not nearly as bad as last time. We are still like within the it's not very probable to happen though. This deck had far too many lands in it. But four were creatures, multiple were fetch. There's a sphere of safety. So... Teferi into a creature does keep me alive, and then I need two turns with the Teferi before they get a Pithy Needle or a Sorcerer Spyglass so that I can pick up the Sphere of Safety. I mean, honestly, it, opponent's got 10 minutes left, and we might need to go to a Game 3, so still not expecting this to go great for them. I need to pick it up. And we had the worst start ever. We should never be going to turn 12.
That's depressing. All right, well, I am going to make them kill me. I think Clock is definitely an out here. Again, I really don't blame anybody for just, especially if you're on YouTube, just close out of it or go hit two times speed because this has been taking an eternity for opponent to top deck and kill me with two ones. The turn I attacked and they created a couple of them was definitely misplay. I also should have just let them block. Killing one would have actually changed the clock again. But we had to mold a five and we had an awful hand and then we got flooded out. Like we have 20 creatures in the stack. Pretty sure. 16. Okay, we went down when we took the whatever thing's out. Thalia is great here. Oriok Champion doesn't matter. Blighted Agent's probably bad, but we do still need creatures to actually win the game. Uh, the Enduring Ideal is a sorcery, so Dispel's not very good. Spell Pierce only works early game, or if our opponent mistaps, I'm not really huge on that. Path to Exile is a really, really dead card. I wouldn't mind having a couple for Heliod, just because that did make the difference there. Uh, Leyline does stop the form of the Dragon Kill, but if they end up getting Solemnity Lock, then I have to have a Teferi to win. Uh, silence doesn't really do it. Oh, Silence can take a Lotus Bloom. I, that actually sounds cute. Like, even if we don't take the win, that sounds cute enough. I want to run it. Uh, we can take out a number of Apostles. No, Apostles Blessing mm -hmm. saved us from the Omphen Isis, which they're running four copies of. Maybe just uh, the other paths. Taking a Lotus Bloom slows them down so significantly. This is a Sigarda's Aid, a Colossus Hammer, a Blighted Agent for lethal. It's basically all I want in life. I should kill them the turn before they even get Solemnity. Uh, also going to be running out Ink Moth next turn just so they can attack. Technically, Ink Moth Animate and Colossus Hammer still lethal on turn three without the Blighted Agent, which gets around Thin Ice, so... Hmm. Blighted Agent's still free. Hopefully they interact with Blighted Agent and feel like they're safe. Why are those steps taking so long? You don't even have a land out. That's a giver of runes. Is giver of runes more important than the blighted agent? Yes, because giver of runes will either eat removal or protect the ink moth nexus on turn three, which should be lethal. So we're going to run out the Ink Moth Nexus and the Giver of Runes. Then if they do happen to find a way to interact with the Ink Moth Nexus, Blighted Agent's the backup plan, but we currently are staging lethal for turn three. With protection. I mean, that's everything we wanted to do with a massive fucking hammer. There's the Anthen Ice. Calciderm pools won't tap for mana, so we should have this. Alright, 13 minute game to 1 minute game. Uh, if I was actually going for the match win, I'd probably try to drag this out. Although they could always just slam a Solemnity and we might not be able to take it, but... I guess they could technically have Dismember here. Oh, that was beautiful. That was so pretty. Uh, I, I 
honestly don't think anything changes. We're just looking for something like that. We are capable of a turn two kill in this deck, but turn three is pretty good. I think investing in the land there was a huge deal because what we identified was the opponent was looking for the sorcery speed removal on with Onthen Ice. We technically could have gotten there a turn slower with the Blighted Agent and the Drawn Apostles Blessing. But getting the Ink Moth Nexus was just cake. Like, they would have had to have a path and they didn't show us one. Alright, this is Giver of Runes, Teferi. So I don't have Lethal in this hand, but I have Interaction as well as the Teferi, so I'm hanging on to it. Opponent did mold a 6 so far, hasn't decided to cat keep. And they keep 6. That's a Nink Moth Nexus, which we've learned is pretty good for lethal. Giver of Runes probably eating an Onthen Ice here. Next turn actually might be a Blighted Agent. So your guard is A can still win out of nowhere, especially with four mana and Ink Moth Nexus. That's a Silence. I don't think the silence matters, though. Uh, ooh, Blood Moon would actually really hurt here. But I think I'm going to Blighted Agent and try to incentivize them to go for a Solemnity here. If they don't and I top deck a Hammer, I still have Lethal. Uh, maybe I actually should have left Giver of Runes back. The one damage doesn't mean anything long term, and now they can Onthen Ice the Blighted Agent. Although I think I'd rather them take the Blighted Agent than the Giver. Okay, well... Teferi does fun things against that. Is it worth just jamming Teferi? I'm going to draw an extra card if I minus, otherwise I'm going to start ticking up and get multiple bounces. That's a Marion Crusader. Alright, well, I'm not attacking Ghostly Prison makes that hard. I think I'm just running out the Marion Crusader, and then even something like a Sword of Fire and Ice is really good. This is a real clock. As well as lethal with the Cigar to Zade. I have the land, so top decking a hammer is still lethal. I have a feeling it's going to come down to the fact that I'm going to have to bounce two turns in a row and not playing Teferi this early has really bit me, but... Right now, I'm just trying to get pressure out. That's the Day of Judgment. So now I definitely need to get Teferi out so that if I get my hammer, then my... Whoa, not that. Chill down, game. I wanted blue. So I can bounce the Ghostly Prison if I draw a hammer for the Ink Moth Nexus. Alright opponent, you're definitely running out of time. I can't imagine what you have. You might have the Red Force here, but that's used for defense. Then my life total doesn't matter, so I'm just going to Cigar to Zade. I, I want to get all my mana down that I need to actually be victorious here. It's 
So if they jam a Solemnity, I can bounce a Solemnity, pay one, attack with the Ink Moth Nexus, have three mana up, that should be a hammer, and that should be lethal. So I have everything I need, I'm just top decking to a hammer. I can also just Teferi to draw an extra card and silence on their upkeep, get the additional draw step. Yeah, I think that's the plan. I need to see more cards here. I'm so close to winning. Uh, this one point of poison I've opted into strictly because I have nothing else to do with my mana. It's running up my opponent's clock slightly, and it's also making it so that if I find a sort of fire nice eventually, I can get a three shot kill as opposed to a four shot. Then I believe I want to silence this turn. Enduring Ideal costs seven. Uh, I have the mana for. Uh, blah 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 attacking through the ghostly prison so I think I kind of don't care uh, sphere of safety here is only going to be for one so it's actively less good than ghostly prison so I'll let them try to get seven mana before I consider silencing I just need to see the cards with the teferi that was really the big get out of this although if this is double ghostly prison then well, I can still get through it just can't activate the Ink Moth. That's a Rune Talo. So hitting the point I wish I would have bounced a Fairy. Rune Halo probably naming Core Duelist. Yep. I mean, being in your instep with one mana up, you really shouldn't be wasting that much time. I don't think attacking with the Ink Moth is going to be overly productive here, but I have the mana, so I can attack in through the Ghostly Prison, still have Silence and Spell Pierce up. Although, this is the turn. Yeah, that's actually just attack. We have the mana. You really don't want to win off a clock, but like when I have 16 minutes and you have two, I feel like I should definitely just be punishing this. Take your poison, sir. Then I'm going to stop on opponent's upkeep and silence them. And then I'll have spell appears for the following turn when they have Enduring Ideal. Also, if I draw a hammer, I can just cash out to Fairy for the win. That's a Blighted Agent. Don't really think it matters. I just want a massive fucking hammer. Is that really so much to ask for? Uh, I'm actually going to try to play around Blood Moon if they have it. Like a Blood Moon into a Sphere of Safety. has eight mana. Going for the Enduring Ideal. There's the Heroic Spell Pierce. And that should be the game. Even if they have a backup Enduring Ideal to go for, yeah, they're just out of time. So, massive fucking hammer! 
Uh, probably actually need to remove this. I'm going to forget if I don't. So what did we learn? First and foremost, it's hard to draw a hammer when you want to draw a hammer. It shouldn't be that hard, but apparently it's hard. So I would probably, well, let's actually go to this view because I messed up. Massive fucking hammer. So we're in blue. There's no reason not to play cantrips. We need Sarah Visions. Like the number of times where I'm like, we just need to top deck would have made a huge difference. The fact that we don't have a blue white horizon land should not be dissuading me. We only have like five blue cards. Okay, I take that back. With the blighted agent, it's actually nine. But we have nine blue cards. We can just run the actual Horizon Canopy or Silent Clarion or Sunbake Canyon or any of the new ones. We need the white canopy land 22 lands is probably too much given that our curve is this low but we also were hitting exponential odds we were at 0.01 percent in one of our games and we were at 0.02 in the other and then we were at 20 percent in another one of them and it's just like are you absolutely kidding me like we went two three with this and it does show the power we ended up getting a turn two kill a turn and two turn three kills like this deck has some oomph to it but you need to see the right pieces, and with Hammer not having a redundant piece, we really need to be able to fill the gap with either another equipment or a way to find the equipment. I know a lot of people were running the uh, Steel Shaper Sanctuary, or I looked at Trinket Mage since we're in blue. Like It just made sense. Go get a Hammer, or I had Basilisk Collar and Walking Ballista, and I actually even started off just white green, and I went through so many different iterations of the stack, but... We need to find the hammer. Like, it it should be stated. Like, the deck's name is Massive Fucking Hammer. We need to find the Massive Fucking Hammer. It should be huge. We should just see it. But Magic's a fun game. Uh, Apostle's Blessing did perform pretty well. Giver of Runes performed really well. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Quest for the Holy Relic might be an option for the stack. And you can run the Argumentum Armor. Uh, you could potentially be running any number of other equipments. I almost put sort of Feast and Famine in this list as well. I don't think Marion Crusader's correct. Teferi was great. Definitely go up to a four of. Uh, him shutting off your opponents as well as being able to pick up your hammer if you have a cigar as eight out or pick up the creature or just take off your opponent's ruined halo or ghostly prison or blood moon on thin ice like i know i'm thinking of a lot of enchantments right there but it was our last match and it took as long as all the other ones combined uh so that's definitely a consideration uh i mentioned in one of our games i probably want stony silence versus etron like chalice just wrecked us i needed some number of disenchants uh something along those lines but stony silence shuts off our actual equip which we did twice tonight uh, those were the games that were like 0.01% probability, so don't want to read into that. Actually build your deck correctly and hopefully just get cycling lands, get a way to filter with Serum Visions, but Chalice was a problem because our hammer was 1 CMC and it was basically our only win condition. We did get some value with the equipments, it just wasn't very strong. Uh, I do think ley lines are good despite the fact we didn't use them tonight. I, I love Thalia, I run four Thalias in my Martyr Proc deck. She's very powerful, but the fact that she increases the cost of your Apostle's Blessings, your Sigarda's Aid, your Hammer, and your Path, she probably doesn't need to be mainboard, but she did work versus Storm, and she would have done really good versus Mono Red Phoenix, just because of the way that their deck is built. I think two in the side is probably too little, but I also really value that card. I know a lot of other people don't. Um, Hogoth's gone, probably don't need all three rips, but Arclight and Dredge are still very big contenders in the meta, so we probably need two to three. Uh, that's going to depend on your local meta. Uh, I, I'm doing a more detailed breakdown than I usually do, because this deck is actually moderately budget, so almost all of the cost of this deck comes from the mana cost. So if I actually do go look at the deck itself... We have two Marian Crusaders, which I said to cut. We have four Path to Exiles, which are pretty clutch. Like, if you're going to buy into Modern, you should buy Paths. If not, there's the new one that Exiles and has Overload. Or you can get, like, Deck and Stone if you're looking for a budget. I do really like Teferi. If you're a standard convert, you might have them. Uh, sort of Fire and Ice really wasn't needed. I like it, but it really wasn't needed. 
Uh, Batter Skull's probably also a pretty good addition, especially if Stoneforge Mystic ever gets unbanned, which it should be. Uh, it's relatively cheap. It puts a 4-4 lifelinker out there. You get another valid threat. You can equip it up to something that has double strike and just gain a ton of life, be a relevant threat. Ink Moths are kind of needed for this. They've gone through a weird, like, I almost want to pull up the MTG stocks for them because they've done cycles where they go up to, like, 40, 50 bucks, and then they've actually dropped down to, like, below 10 at times. Um, but really good card. It did show its strength, especially for sorcery speed removal. And the mana base can be budget. Like, I put in cards that I thought would be good, but you don't necessarily need three hollowed founds or even the flooded strands. Like, you could do basics. It's mostly a white deck. I do like the canopy lands, but that's also going to increase the price. Uh, if you just want to cheese people out, this is definitely an option. And a lot of these cards are also shared with Martyr Proc, which is the other deck I usually recommend to new players. So... Uh, that's probably why I'm focusing on this so much is because this is like a switch off deck for Martyr Proc. A lot of these cards transfer over. But it, it needs another hammer. And Ogre's Cleaver didn't ever fill the slot, but that was the closest I was doing before. And I think that's all I've really got to contribute. But uh, guys, I am 13. I do a lot of janky decks. Uh, if you actually even watch as I pulled this up, like there is just a r bunch of random garbage in here. I say garbage, but a lot of them actually performed pretty well. Like, I absolutely loved running Narset Cannon. Aria Punisher, I've actually been working on a rerun for, but, like, Black White Tokens did well. Snow Black Devotion did well. Uh, we do a lot of really fun decks here, though, and Brad One does a number of competitive ones. Uh, G-Burn does standard arena stuff and just really fun janky decks we really try to have fun uh if you have a deck that you'd like me to take a look at i'm i'll always respond to a deck but if it's something for on stream i'll definitely give you a shout out send it to decks at squirrel dealer.com uh, if you are looking for decks feel free to check out our website just squirrel dealer.com or search for it on youtube and we've got a whole history of everything that we've been running here uh, if you like our content we end up hosting all of our streamers through the Squirrel Dealer staff account on Twitch and we're happy to respond to questions on Twitter or if you want to hit me directly feel free to message me on Reddit or just respond on YouTube we'll we'll address whatever you're feeling but feel free to like subscribe all that fun stuff and uh, go hit some people with a massive fucking hammer and in the future we won't be swearing as much just really felt like we needed it for this deck and thanks for watching have a good one